Yeah. Okay. We're in uh, Philippians chapter one. Philippians chapter one. So I know what you're thinking if you're a guest. I expected to see Hank Aaron up to bat and I got Dizzy Magoo instead. Um, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Philippians chapter one. Well, that didn't go over very well. Okay. Can I at least get a courtesy laugh or something? Yeah. Okay, good. Good. Okay, so I want to take you to Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Because we're having communion, the Lord's Supper, um, at the end of the, of the message, I want to speak to you uh, from three verses in chapter 1 on the theology of suffering. The theology of suffering. We're in the book of Philippians. Uh, Paul is a prisoner in Rome. When he writes this book, it's in the early 60s. That's not like the early 1960s or 1860s. It's like the 60s, um, 60 years basically after the birth of Christ, about 25, 30 years after the crucifixion. So these are early uh, folks in the scripture. Uh, Paul is the founder of the Philippian church he's writing to. If you look in Acts chapter 16, you'll see that he and some of his buddies went out looking for a place of prayer one morning, and they were in Philippi. They met Lydia, who was a seller of purple, who was a worshiper of God, but didn't know Christ. They shared Christ with her. She became a believer. And then that's the famous chapter of the Philippian jailer, where after Paul gets in trouble with the authorities because Paul cast out an evil spirit from a girl, um, and the slave owner got angry because he lost his living, um, Paul was thrown in jail. That's when the scripture says at midnight, they were singing, praising God and worshiping and a great earthquake hit. The jail doors open and the jailer was going to kill himself because he thought Paul and all the other guys escaped. Paul said, don't do that. Uh, we're still here. And the jailer, because apparently of what he heard during the night, them preaching and praying and singing about God, uh, the jailer says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And then he and his whole uh, household were baptized as were Lydia and her whole household. So that's Philippi. That's that area. That's where the church started. And that's the book. That's the people he's writing to in the book of Philippians. So Paul is under house arrest at the time of this writing, most likely. Uh, in Acts chapter 28, verse 16, we see that he's at, at uh, uh, house arrest. There's a guard that's kind of outside his door, but he's free to come and go. So the message is about the theology of suffering. While Paul was under house arrest, that was the least of his worries uh, during his time uh, sharing the gospel. Paul suffered greatly for the gospel. I'm going to read a couple of extra passages for you. You don't need to turn to them. But if you, uh, would, if you find the place in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he said, um, we are, when we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we kindly answer or we answer kindly, we have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world right up until this moment. That's what happened when Paul shared the gospel. He said, we've been attacked, and now we have become the scum of the earth and the garbage of the world. If you flip over a few pages, you'll find where he talks about what he's gone through. He said, I've been in prison uh, more frequently uh, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Since I was pelt, uh, Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. Uh, doesn't leave much out there. I have labored and toiled and have gone, often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst, and I've, I've often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressures of my concern for all the churches. Paul had a struggle because of his witness in the gospel. Because of what he was saying about Jesus Christ, he suffered. 
There's a theology of suffering in the scripture, and I want to address that this morning from Philippians chapter 1, verses 12, 12, verses 13, and 14. So let me begin with this idea that the theology of suffering is not the same as the lament of fools for their stupidity or foolishness. There's a difference in suffering for God and just being an idiot. And we have, yeah, we have seen people who just act foolishly and then put a Christian tag on it. And then they say, I'm being, I'm being martyred for my faith. I'm being punished. No, you're being punished because you're not likable, because you're offensive. It has nothing to do with the message. It has to do with your attitude and your actions. So we need to separate the two. One, we suffer in, because of our theology or we get a just consequence because of our stupidity and our unlikableness. All right? So I want to separate those two. All right, so let's read the scripture. Philippians chapter 1, verses 12, 13, and 14. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. What's happened to him? Well, verse 13. As a result, it has become clear through the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. So in many cases, Paul's suffering, uh, I should say Paul's theology and his preaching led to his suffering and his condemnation. But here in, Phil in Philippians, He's asking the Philippian church, or he's telling them, here's what's happened to me, and here's what's happened because of the gospel witness. So I want to begin with two quick questions. How had the gospel cause been affected by Paul's suffering? How had the gospel cause been affected by Paul's suffering? In Philippi, uh, I'm sorry, in Rome where he wrote the letter, was he shunned? Was he discarded? Was he mocked? Was he ignored? No, he wasn't. In fact, the gospel advanced by his imprisonment. That was the outcome of his suffering. He wasn't shunned or discarded. The gospel advanced. Here's the second question. How had the gospel cause affected people while Paul suffered? Well, if you look in this, in this section, it says in verse 13, as a result of my persecution in prison, it has become clear throughout the entire palace guard. Those people guarding him and watching him, it became clear to them and to everyone else that was around me that I'm in chains for Christ. It's very clear that his suffering was because of Christ, and they knew it. And then the second response was, and because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. So his suffering affected two groups. It affected the lost people around him, the guards that were with him and their families, and it affected the church, the believers. So his suffering led to two positive things. In fact, if you look at um, chapter 4, same book, chapter 4, verse 21, we have this. Greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me in Rome send greetings. All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Caesar was not a Jew. Caesar was, the, in essence, the king of the land, the occupation force. It is Caesar, the Roman, and his household that have been hearing the gospel. And so something happened spiritually to many in the household of Caesar, where it says, especially, especially those who belong to the, to the household of Caesar greet you. Translation, there are many believers in Caesar's household now. Why was that? Because the suffering that Paul endured because of his proclamation of the gospel. The theology of suffering brings suffering, and then it brings the gospel to light. I want to share with you uh, four observations from this passage, and then we'll observe the Lord's Supper. I want to give you a preface, though, before I give you the four 
observations. Here's the preface. If you look for trouble, if you're a bully, if you're pushy, if you're obnoxious, trouble will find you and you will suffer and it's your own fault. If you're a bully and a troublemaker, it's not biblical suffering. You're not a martyr. You're just unlikable. And so I want to make that clear that sometimes when we do things, people don't like the message, but often when we do things, they don't like the delivery. There will be a time shortly in which I'm going to address a church in our association, and the message is going to be a little bit difficult. And so I'm working hard on that message that the message is biblical, and if there's any offense, it's going to be because it's biblical, not because of my attitude or actions in delivering that message. Do you understand the difference? We have to be careful how we bring the gospel to people. We have to be careful how we work with people. We have to, as, as Jesus said, I am gentle and humble in heart. When we bring the message of the gospel, we must be gentle and humble of heart, not be an idiot and be a bully. And so I want to make that clear that the suffering of the theology of suffering has nothing to do with how bad we act. It has to do with the message of Christ. So let me give you four observations. Number one, you may suffer just for who you are as a Christian, and this will become standard operating procedure. You may suffer just for who you are as a Christian, just for being a Christian. I'll give you an example. Right now across America and across our college campuses, Jews are suffering for who they are. The, the unkept secret about Israel is it's one of the most secular nations on earth. You say Israel, you mean Jew, you think religion, you think godliness, you think Old Testament practices. Israel is not that. Israel is highly secular, and very few people are religious according to the Jewish traditions and laws. So people who are Jewish don't automatically follow the Jewish law. Here's another unkept secret. Most people who claim themselves to be Christian really have no idea what that means and have no intention of living that way. We just call ourselves that. We put on our necklaces and our earrings and we put on our tattoos. We put on crosses and we put on verses. And then we go out and live like the devil. But yet, we call ourselves Christian. You may suffer just for who you are as a Christian. Uh, two weeks ago, I think it was, I read an article about an Englishman who was standing outside an abortion clinic uh, somewhere in Great Britain, just standing there, silent. No sign, no verbiage, nothing, just silently. There's a law in England, apparently, that you cannot pray outside of an abortion clinic. So the police came up and asked him, are you praying? He said, no. They gave him a fine for standing there, assuming he was praying. He broke no law except just standing outside, and it was outside the, the whatever zone they have, the demilitarized zone, you know, around those things. He was fined for standing outside the clinic. He was given a fine because they assumed he was a Christian. I work with Arizona Children's, uh, how do we say, Arizona Baptist Children's Services out of Tucson. They work all over the state. They're part of our convention. There is a move within our state government to bar ABCS from dealing with foster kids and dealing with counseling because of the mission statement and the biblical background that ABCS has. Because we're evangelical Christian, we're not inclusive. Therefore, the state is threatening to withhold funding, which is millions of dollars to ABCS because of our beliefs. Not that ABCS has done anything wrong. Not that the, the foster parents and the adoptive parents have done anything wrong, simply because we have a mission statement and a biblical statement that says Christ is Lord and we'll live under a certain set of moral uh, uh, platitudes. All right? So you may suffer 
just for who you are as a Christian. Here's number two. You may suffer for what you stand for vocally. Not just that you're a Christian, but you take the next step. You may suffer for what you stand for vocally. The gospel message is that Christ is the answer. And the scripture says to the Jews, that's a stumbling block. And to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, the non-believers of anything, that is foolishness. The Judeo-Christian ethic of righteousness and godliness, when stood up for, will cause suffering for us. Stephen the martyr in Acts chapter 7 stood up for the gospel. He preached the gospel that Christ died for our sins, that he rose again, and that he's coming back. And because of that message, the people, the Jews, took up stones and stoned him to death. And Paul, the one who wrote this letter, was standing there. Actually, his name was Saul at that time. Was standing there giving approval of the killing of Stephen. And now Paul, after the conversion, Paul is talking about the theology of suffering. So you will suffer for what you stand up for vocally. Last week, the place kicker for the Kansas City Chiefs, I think the guy's name is Butker, I'm not sure, but I think that's his name, gave a commencement speech at a Catholic university. He was the commencement speaker, and he congratulated the students, both men and women, for their great achievements. And he told the men and women, and he singled out the women and said, you are destined for great things. You have a great education. Many of you will make your mark on this world in your profession. You have earned the right. You have done all these wonderful things. And then he said, some of you may choose to be a wife and a mother and see that as your highest calling. And he went on to talk about the idea of being pro-life. This is at a Catholic university, to Catholic university graduates. After he told them and commended them for their hard work and they were going to make a mark on society, he dared to say that it was good for a woman to be a wife and a mother and that she could do that in addition to making a world, her mark on the professional world. And you'd have thought he pulled out a gun and killed six people right on the spot. The response from the left was hatred and vitriol. When we choose to stand and say, it's okay to be righteous, or something as simple as, it's okay to be a mom and be happy about that. It's okay to be a lawyer and a mom and be happier that you're a mom than a lawyer. When we say something about righteousness, we will suffer because we stand vocally for what's right. So number one, you may suffer for, what, for who you are just because you're a Christian. Number two, you may suffer for what you stand for vocally, and it's going to become standard operating procedure. Here's number three. You may suffer for what you stand against. Not just what you stand for, but what you stand against. We're already seeing that happen. Boy, you say one word against certain groups in this country, and you are just thrown in the toilet. You say, you can have any cake you want out of my bakery shop, but I won't make a cake honoring your homosexual marriage. And they basically take your business and find you into oblivion. The evil that is done to our society, we must stand against. This transgender business and this radical homosexuality. But here's the problem. Here's why people hate us on these issues. Because often we attack the transgender person or the homosexual instead of loving them and sharing the gospel, instead of caring for them and going after the ones who are perpetuating this and pushing it on us, the evil that's behind this, we take it out on the one who's been duped by all this and the one who needs the love to come back to the gospel. We suffer sometimes not because we stand against something, but because 
we're a bully and we pick on the wrong people. I'm in no way approving of transgender issues or homosexuality. Don't hear me say that. But you remember who Christ hung out with? He hung out with the prostitutes and the sinners and the tax collectors. And he shared the gospel with them. Who did he condemn? He condemned those who were putting the yoke of people on them. He was uh, the yoke on people that they couldn't hold up to. The religious leaders, not the guy on the street, not the poor sap who was cheating people and didn't know any better, but that was just a sin nature. He hung out with those guys and shared the gospel with them. He protected the prostitutes and shared the gospel with them. We would fall over dead if some of those folks walked in here and took a seat front and center. <laughs> we need to be against the right issues and love the people. That's hard to do. John the Baptist, during the early part of Jesus' ministry, was a guest of Herod. He, uh, as they say, what's that saying? He got a warm cot and three squares a day. He was in prison. And John would come in and talk to Herod. And one day John came to Herod and said, Hey, buddy old pal, king, you're sleeping with your sister-in-law. Not good. Well, that made Herodias, his sister-in-law, so angry. She got her daughter into a scheme that eventually ended up with John the Baptist being beheaded and his head being brought to Herod on a platter in full view of a huge banquet. John was against the sin that was open in Herod's life and it cost him his life. We're going to suffer for what we stand against. When I was in seminary, I worked at UPS for a while. And uh, UPS, um, which I, I love UPS, I have nothing against UPS. But at that time, uh, they were part of the United Way campaign. They wanted people to join United Way campaign and give every year. And uh, I refused to give to United Way because one of United Way's uh, biggest benefactors was Planned Parenthood, the sponsor of more abortions in America than any group that we can ever imagine. And so it was okay that UPS wanted their employees to, to donate to United Way. I just chose not to participate. But they had this deal where they wanted 100% compliance. As they said, 100% participation. So they could say 100% of our people in this plant participated. Well, I refused. Now I was too young and dumb to know that I could have been punished for that. But it's possible that you're in a situation where this society says you have to do this to conform and you say, no, I won't, and you might have to suffer for it. Number one, you may suffer just for who you are as a Christian. Number two, you may suffer for what you stand for vocally. Number three, you may suffer for what you stand against vocally. You know, what's interesting is that my, my wife and I lived in the Middle East for five years. She lived there for seven, but I lived there for five years. And you'd think that's where the gospel witness, I'd be suffering. You'd think, oh man, you were there five years, 96% Muslim. Um, you must have really suffered. No, not at all. Isn't that fascinating? I was an American in a Muslim society. In Jordan, we lived in a small town of 60,000. There were probably 10 of us white guys, men and women, children, and 60,000 Arabs. You think, man, that must have been dangerous. No. Nope. You know what they wanted to do to us? They wanted us to come in, drink tea, and help them with their green card to get to America. Jordan was a party waiting to happen. It was a wonderful place. 
I mean, aside from the honor killings and the wife beatings and all those other things, we were in no danger. We lived in Damascus, Syria. I walked from the church to our apartment many nights, late at night, across a city of two or three million people, a long walk, never once afraid. Now, there are, there are reasons for that. That was long before all this current stuff. I, I wouldn't last five minutes in Damascus today. You know, it's interesting that sometimes we think persecution and suffering comes from certain places. It's not coming from those places. It's coming from our own. It's coming from our own society. Here's number four. See, that. let me go back and, and do this one more time and then ask you a question. You may suffer for what you are or for who you are just because you are. You may suffer for what you stand for vocally. Uh, you may stand, you may suffer for what you stand against vocally. Now, raise your hand if you think, man, this has just been one of the most uplifting messages and just heartwarming things I've ever heard in my life. Okay, you guys are all liars. Um, so, I mean, it's like, good night. Can you not send us out with something a little more positive? Okay, here it is. Number four. This is the positive. Suffering may bring new audiences for the gospel. Suffering might bring new audiences for the gospel. You see what the scripture says? The gospel message was heard by the lost. In Rome, Paul said, the guards are hearing the gospel. Caesar's household is greeting you as new believers. You know what the other benefit is? That the new audience was the current believers because the scripture says that the people gained more confidence to share the Lord and the fear of persecution subsided. They have less fear to stand for the gospel. I don't know any of us that have suffered because of, that we belong to Christ. I don't know any of us has suffered because we attend a Baptist church. I think those days are coming. I don't know when they're coming, but I think they're coming. I think we're being shunned in the society, and we're not allowed to do things we used to do, like adopt and foster in many places, especially blue states. Those things are being shunned. We're being shunned from those issues. Those blue state ideas will, will affect the red states sooner or later. It'll affect all America. But right now, we're not, we're not suffering because of our Christianity. And we should not think we're suffering for our Christianity. But one day we will. What will happen when persecution comes to America? What will happen when real persecution comes? I don't know. What will I do when persecution comes? I know what I hope to do, but I don't know what I'll do. Will this church be empty? because everybody runs for the hills? Or will this church be full because the gospel is being spread and people are standing for Jesus? I don't know. In China, they tried to stamp out Christianity and there are more house churches and secret believers than any time in history. In the Middle East, you can be thrown out for witnessing to a Muslim, but yet there are more believers now in the Middle East than there ever have been. Many of them are secret believers. They're being persecuted. The Chinese are being persecuted. What will happen to us? I don't know. It may be that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. An old saying from our forefathers, that when persecution comes, we actually act like, like believers and share the gospel and people come in spite of the persecution. Well, the theology of suffering. There's no greater example of the theology of suffering than what Christ did for us. Christ suffered and died for us. He is the ultimate theology of suffering for what he did. He, the Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. He suffered on our behalf. When he hung on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
He was suffering, not just physically, but the sin of the world was upon him, and God the Father could not look upon sin. God turned his back, and the suffering took place in order to bring us salvation. And as soon as that was done, Jesus said, it is finished. He gave up the ghost. He died. He was buried. Three days he rose again, and therefore we have the Lord's Supper to commemorate. When he was having his last meal with the disciples, he said, we're going to eat this bread and we're going to drink this this wine and we're going to commemorate my body and my blood and I want you to do this until I come back. What he did was he suffered for us so that we might live. He gave his life, he took our sin that we might live, that we might have life in Christ. Christ. 